My name is Michael Wilson. I'm the project manager for the Northern Region um, Hepatitis C program um, with the Northern, um, Northern Regional Alliance. So we're an organisation that works across the four DHBs up here, um, helping coordinate their services. Um, what I'm going to be talking about tonight is a national laboratory look back um, project. When we first launched the project three years ago, we were asking primary care to go through these databases, try and find these needles in the haystack. Um, and when I say needles in the haystack, it, it came down to how your nurses or your admin staff or whoever is receiving results back from lab tests, um, how they input it into their system and what codes they used. And, and there are multiple, multiple um, versions of that. So we did a little bit of a trial with um, Northland, uh, Northland DHB and the patients up there through um, Manaya and uh, Titai Tokoro uh, and looked at all the lab results, uh, positive hepatitis C for the antibody, uh, and then went to the reference lab. Um, so for us here in Auckland, it's um, primarily Lab Plus, but Wider Mata and Counties DHBs also do RNA testing as well. And cross-matched those that had an antibody positive, did they have uh, an RNA positive test, had they had an RNA test done, and then the list of patients that hadn't been tested for an RNA, or were positive for an RNA, um, then got sent out to their respective GPs to follow up. Um, so suddenly the needle in the haystack becomes um, a 50 inch flat screen TV in your lounge. Um, and they could readily, obviously, um, contact the <coughs> and work from there. That was then taken, and uh, Pharmac and Ministry looked at that and went, well, that's a good idea, let's do that on a national basis. So they contracted with um, Lab Tests and, and Arlo Upton, um, who ran our Northern data for us, and um, retrieved all of the information from all of the community <coughs> laboratories to get the antibody results. Um, and out of that, they had something like 28,000 um, odd uh, antibody positive patients. So we sort of start off over here, 28,000. Um, cross match to NHIs um, for the RNA results. So there's five reference labs um, here in New Zealand, plus the, uh, the two DHDs here in Auckland. Remove false DNHIs, and when I say false DNHIs, um, often with uh, community labs, uh, sorry, with, with CADs or with um, needle exchanges, um, needle exchanges as an anonymous service, um, so they had um, dumb numbers for those sorts of patients, so remove those anomalies out of the system. Obviously, we don't want to worry about those um, 3,000 patients that have already been treated um, on the pharmac treatment, so all of those were removed. I don't know whether Ed got to put in his list of all his trial data patients, um, but anyone who returned a negative RNA was removed anyway, so he's very good at testing with his patients on his trials. Um, and then the last bit of the puzzle was removing any of those patients that had only ever had a test done at CADS or needle exchange or in the prison system. Uh, and the reason for that is that data may not necessarily be sitting in your GP record. Even though you've got this wonderful file of all these notes, um, if the patient said we don't want that transferred across, then um, we may sure that that data hasn't come out to you. The last bit of that puzzle, um, now that we're down at around, I don't remember what number we're up to, um, was to match to the March age 6 report for their enrolled GP. So that was the last bit of the puzzle that Pharmac and Lab Test did for us. And it left us with um, just over 3,000 patients in the, in the um, metro Auckland area. With agreement from the clinical directors from all of the PHOs, rather than everyone go off and do their own thing, we thought a coordinated approach where everyone does the same thing in roughly the same time. Um, we can really take a good chunk of these patients and, and manage them and get them cured. So at the moment, we're just about to put them through a process of matching to the, I'm not sure whether you call it the September ASR or the October ASR, the latest one anyway. Um, 
So to, you'll end up with a list of patients coming to you that um, should be, for all intents and purposes, enrolled in your clinic. There will be a number of patients that kind of have disappeared off the radar. They're, they're not now in anyone's enrolled population data set. Um, and what is intended with those patients is we know that this list was matched to the March register, um, so they will go to whoever it was matched in that March register. What it means for you is if they're no longer registered with you, hopefully you've been contacted by their new GP and said send their patient to <coughs> approve. Sounds simple? Does it work? Yes. Big dream. Too good to be true? <laughs> okay. So if, if you have got the details and you can forward it on, forward it, the, the details as you would with the normal medical record. If you can't, um, and this is a suggestion that hasn't been approved as yet, because I'm taking it to the Metro Clinical Governance Forum next Thursday, um, is for those patients to come to me um, or to the regional program, because we can then work with the ministry um, and with Pharmac on how we do that more appropriately, manage the data uh, and, and the um, contact with these patients very carefully. Do we have contact details and things like that? Can we locate them? Have they moved out of area? So they may be a patient that if I send it to the same program coordinator in, that does the rotary area, they go, yep, we've got that patient down here now. Um, as I said, notification will come out to you if we split this amount of patients amongst everyone, I think it's about four or five patients per GP. Pool to centre has about 75 percent. No, 75 patients currently yes. that we know of. No, I want that. I want the list. That are on the list. Right. We suspect there's more. <laughs> um, and then you've got other. Um, GP clinics that specialise in these types of patients, they have high numbers, so you'll get, a, you'll, you'll get one or two, maybe five or ten. What we would suggest from there, oh, put that there. Um, so there's an information sheet in your packs um, that the PHL put together that kind of explains what I've just talked about. Um, what I'm going to go into now essentially is that document there. Hopefully this all works. Fun on us. Um, so this is a tool that you could have on your computer if you wanted. Um, or all the information, in fact, what it points to is, is further down, uh, essentially in the pack. What we would suggest, though, is when you have those patients in HIs, you then do a desktop search. Um, as I mentioned before, they can already be coded within your system. Recodes, ICD-9, ICD-10s. There are 80 different codes for hepatitis. There's only five types of hepatitis. Four types of hepatitis. But 80 codes for hepatitis. Um, those are the 13 that relate most to potentially hepatitis C. Um, and if you went looking in that particular patient's file for those, um, hopefully it would pop up with something. Um, or you get a laboratory test result that comes back. And as I said, it depends on how you, how it was entered into your system. Uh, for some people, they might say that it is uh, a liver investigation, a liver result, a liver serology, a liver RNA. Or they could have put hepatitis C. Or they could have put just hep C, serology, hep C, RNA, hep C, blood test. Um, so it does get complicated. What I would suggest is once you've done all that, we do some future proofing. Let's keep it simple. I'm a simple guy. Uh, A70Z0, hepatitis C. Easy. Then when we have to go looking for those patients again, if we ever need to, um, that's what we need to look for. Um, and then you can put just a simple um, notation beside it. Um, work up required, so if there's still some testing to be done. Um, decline treatment. Patients have all sorts of viable reasons for doing so. Um, they might be awaiting treatment. Those that are genotype 1 um, 
don't want to start on like Heropac and uh, happy to wait for the, the new drug to become available. Um, or if they're not in a type 1, obviously, they're, they're on the waiting list. Um, if they've failed treatment or if they're cured. Nice and simple. If you ever wanted to go back and look and find them, you've, you've been there, done that um, already. I'm not sure who within your practice would do that, whether it be the, um, one of your nurses or admin staff task with Just while we're here, uh, I'll just pick up this quick note here. Um, sickness beneficiary patients, we've had anecdotal reports back that some of them don't want to get tested for hep C or don't want to get treated for hepatitis C. Uh, there's a bit of a rumour going around that these drugs cure you. Um, in curing you, they actually make you feel normal. If you've been feeling crap for a good part of your life, they actually make you feel good. If I feel good, do I qualify for my sickness benefit? Um, many of these patients have other comorbidity factors that, that are going to trigger their, um, their, their benefit status. So um, for some of those patients, when you get down to having some conversations with them, those are some of the bits you might need to tease out uh, and have a conversation around. If you're using this tool online, at the bottom of them, I've put a return to the top to keep things nice and simple. And it takes us straight back up to there. Um, so the orange boxes, uh, you know, it's got an orange around it, there's a nice simple click in um, that helps us get into there. Um, so when we're making contact with the patients, I've never done it, I'm not a clinician, so anything I say, don't hold it against me. Um, but obviously, if with contact details and we've got the phone number or what have you that we have for the patient, if it doesn't connect to anything, there's not much you can do about it. Um, is it a wrong number? So if you've got hold of, there's someone on the other end, I'm looking for Joe, don't know Joe, can't help you. Um, if you do know who it is, uh, and you've got the right person, would you leave a voice message or a text message, please contact the clinic or however you would like to do that. Um, but look at different days, different times of the day to try and make contact with these patients. Um, hopefully they're patients that you're aware of already within the system. Um, being an, an enrolled patient with them, but maybe not. of uh, NHIs that you come through, you'll be advised that they have one of uh, three states. Um, it might be that they only have an antibody result. Okay? It means they're antibody positive, but they've never uh, actually been tested for, for the virus itself, the RNA result. Um, so we'll still treat them as uh, potentially having it and, and they need to um, have further testing done. The other two options that you get uh, is that they have a positive RNA, but they've never had um, a, a genotyping done. Uh, and with Maverick coming online, um, when that comes online, uh, we won't need to worry about genotype anyway. Uh, and then you have got a positive RNA result and you've got a genotype. And those ones are they're as worked up as they possibly could be um, when you're getting your hands on them. I should mention here, one of the downsides to this data, this data, when uh, lab test called the data from all the community labs, goes back to 2007. There is nothing in the information that you'll get that will tell you when the test result happened. Uh, if it's I've been over the last three or four years, five or six years, um, they may be aware of it. If it's earlier than that, um, depending on how the testing was done, who tested them, um, a patient may not be aware of. And it may have been a conversation at a sexual health clinic. We're going to test you for HIV, let's test you for C or B. At the same time, they're only interested because they've got a rash or a scratch. They're not going to go back for that follow-up consult. The doctor said something about hip pain. Uh, and that conversation is, is dying. So just a word of caution that the patients when you're contacting them may not be 
aware of their status. Okay, so it's just a gentle conversation, and there's some information again in that handout that kind of can lead you through um, some of those. Sorry to interrupt, no, but where do you find this flowchart? In your pack, in your pack. So there's, oh, no, there's no, one in your pack. You're saying oh, click on something on the computer. So how does right. it get it's, onto our computer? Is that in the text? It's, it's, so it's not in the text at the moment. Email it out. Um, um, it's it's my Actually, that would be the place to, well, we can, we can drop it into the health pathways. Um, I, I all compare it to practice list, through the Mohio uh, platform, it'll be a, we're developing new form living, and you'll be able to click any button there. Oh, it's even better. I don't know why Bob is spending so much time on this, it's all brilliant. Join up with me. And as a health pathway has been mentioned there, I've lost my mask, there's no mask on there, it is. Um, it works. Um, how many people have been to the Health Pathway site? Okay. How, how many people have treated hepatitis C? Few of you. Um, so on the, on the website, um, there's two parts to it. There's chronic hepatitis C, um, which takes you through the diagnostic process of it. Um, there is also a, another link off this, which is to the treatment side the of it. The good news is, <coughs> because it's so simple, we now combine it into one. So it's you'll see... smash it. Yeah, it's, it's, that's just going to be another... We've concentrated the whole amount, maybe somewhere other than that's now. It's not a separate thing. That's in the new pathway. The new pathway. It's going to be launched. Right. right. Um, that's kind of a pathway developed by Helen Riley and, and um, the, the team here in, uh, in Auckland. Um, that's everything you need to know. This presentation mm -hmm. information will go on there. All of the resources that you could use with patients, everything. It's a, it's a nice, simple one-stop shop. They also have a link to Bridget's um, Liverpool website. So if you are worried about any potential drug interactions, which are uncommon. But not on that one. Because that was the diagnostics. It would be on the treatment one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, very the key points. There is some wind support available for patients. Um, specifically for hepatitis C, if you go onto the WINS website and you typed in hepatitis C, it will take you to this. It's taken a year and a half to get them to do that, but now it does it. Um, to access the financial support, the client has to make an appointment and go in and meet with a caseworker at work and income. There's two payments that can come out of it, um, a special needs grant which can uh, help pay for the co-payment um, to see you at your clinic. So the normal part charge for the scenario. Um, the second part of to that, and they, for a special need grant, you have uh, urgent and necessary needs. You have no other way to meet the costs in our New Zealand citizen or permanent resident. Um, essentially, what's that saying is if you would normally qualify for a community services card, then you can access this grant. In terms of the urgency of it, well, if I don't get treated, then I potentially get cancer and potentially need Ed to spend lots of money on giving me a transplant, and this is a hell of a lot of people much easier. So to facilitate all that, we are suggesting that you actually print this sheet off and hand it to the patient and get them to take it in with them. We've gone through there very quickly what they might need to do that. So if they're not already in with the system, they'll need uh, identification, um, uh, there is a requirement there, proof of any assets that can earn income, details of your business income, Again, the patients that you're sort of considering this for, it's a bit of a no-brainer, I think. So is that grant a different one over and above when we've been told by WINS just to write a letter for the patient to take to WINS to say that they need some help to pay for their doctors, their upstanding doctors? If you've got something that the patient can physically walk into them and hand to them that basically spells it out for them, so it doesn't have doesn't to be the stuff that we 
we've, we have had patients. We've a bit more yeah. confidential about and, and, and what you know. We have had um, patients that uh, Ed and Bridget have, have sent and they've turned up to the office and they've gone home without doing payments for years. Admittedly, I'd say that was six, eight months ago. Yeah. Um, but it was after they categorically told us, no, we've got support available. So anything that can break that down. Um, in terms of the urgent need, how many visits are they going to need to see you? Um, if you're looking at something like Black Hero Pack, uh, at the moment you're probably looking at four or five visits, perhaps. Um, when you're looking at Maverick, you may be looking at two or three. Um, if you put that on there, it makes them easy to calculate and work out how much they might need to pay. Um, the second part of the funding, there's no prescription cost, there's no pharmacy cost at all, there's not even the $5 or $3 surcharge when you walk into the pharmacy, it is completely free. Um, so the only other cost is, is travel, and if they're travelling more than I think it's 8 kilometres, I think it says there, 8 kilometres to the place of treatment, um, then they can get support with that as well. Um, so patient address, medical centre, work it out from there. We've already got something up and running, great. Um, for those patients that do agree, um, and they're, they're needing to get blood test forms, you may not even need to see them, you might be comfortable just saying, okay, I've got a blood test form that you need to pick up at the counter, and come in and get that and take, go to the nearest community lab and get that tested. I'd also suggest um, you give them that brochure, um, you don't have that brochure currently. We've uh, got a stock of those that are about to go out um, for it. Um, but it has all the information that I have in there, including fibre scanning and things like that involved. Um, that folds up into a nice A6 a the trifold. Carry on down. Um, if you refer them for a Hep C RNA test and they come back as negative, um, a key thing to consider is: Are they a patient that is still undertaking risk behaviour? Are they still injecting drug use? And are they aware that they should can, should and can get clean needles from pharmacies or needle exchange services and do all of that? Um, keep themselves safe. And again, there's a link in there, and I'll take you straight through the harm reduction. Um, you can type in there the, um, the suburb, and it'll spit out where they can, which pharmacy they need to go to to get their needles or, or what have you. Okay, there's a list of resources um, on the left hand side here as well, um, that one takes you to the brochure that I've just shown you, um, there's a direct link to the Pharmac website, um, as Ed uh, has alluded to, um, there's a BPAC article in there, currently talks about uh, current treatment which is with Bacterapac and that'll be updated nice and simplified, um, and there's also a webinar for those that enjoyed Ed's presentation earlier. You can uh, go on for an hour long webinar and get more. Right, so we did a good fellow webinar last year, no, two years ago, after Bicurapac came out, and that was very popular. So uh, was, we had it out at the um, Campy, uh, campus for the uh, Department of Practice, and there's going to be another one uh, I'm going to run with the GP who's currently treating. Uh, Early next year, about 2000. And it's going to be very much simpler than tonight and a few case, case studies. Okay. Um, I've also, I did manage to get in there a little bit on the APRI. Um, and again, from the uh, Health Pathways website, it can take you directly to this. But takes you through the um, AST to pay the ratio, you type straight into the screen what your um, what your results that came back from the lab look like and it'll give you a score. Um, it talks about if it's over one, then they need a fibre scan. 
get them to get a fibrous scan. If it's under one, then they're safe to treat them from the field. Okay, and you can see that they're um, coming down. There is an additional financial um, um, way of financing or assisting the patient um, with that. In the northern region, um, and only in the northern region, we've put aside some money uh, which is available through the POEC system, just for a purpose of reimbursement. Um, but it's $100 per patient, and the idea being there that it covers the co-payment um, part of it. Uh, with Vicarapac, it was one of those consultations where you're possibly uh, talking to the patient about their risk behaviours, talking to them about the medication and how that works, looking at the medications that they're on and adjusting doses and things like that, and that ends up being the 30-40 minute consultation. Um, so we've looked at the $100 to try and um, get a reasonable balance there. Some will say it's not enough, um, others will say it's too much. Uh, it, it's something that only the Northern Region has done. So that is available for those patients that perhaps don't qualify for the WINS support, um, uh, but may find the financial aspects of it. So, so my compliment. going forward uh, with obviously Maverick is going to be a lot more straightforward in terms of time and tends to be giving people on treatment as at the same type of payment. Right, so the agreement at the moment is um, that this is in place until September next year. 30th September. We're going to review it in March. <coughs> I'm going to push for let's keep it going because if it helps you get these patients in, then $100 here versus $500,000 plus for a transplant, plus all the other medical treatment that they need getting there. Um, hey, it's a no brainer. Um, but we will need to reassess it um, with Maverick because with Maverick, everything that I'm hearing about it is um, so you wanted a couple of Panadol for your take this for the next eight weeks. Good luck. The feedback we got was uh, $100, a lot of GPs thought $100 was not enough. I was prepared to uh, treat, uh, in fact, the uptake. The payments being very low, isn't it, right? Uh, um, we've had so about 50, 53 patients utilise it in the whole of the northern region over the last two years. Which is it's just a, a tiny proportion of the number of people who have been treated in general practice. So, um, so it's got information in the on, on that last one, we're under GP treatment episode. Mm -hmm. um, you, it says to arrange a fiber scan if one's not been completed within the last three years. So if there has been a fiber scan in the last three years, yep. and you, I guess you've got your hip feet, your hip seat positive result, generally yep. if you've done that, can you start the Maverick without repeating it or doing the aspirin? Uh, you can start. I mean, the, uh, the reason we, we push for uh, trying to stage the liver disease with a fiber scan or aspirin before you start is no matter how severe the liver disease is, all those tests become normal after someone's cured. Because these tests measure not just scarring, they measure inflammation. And once the hep C's gone, uh, then uh, the person may be cirrhotic, but all the tests we use are, are normal. So you don't know if you test after. But you'll your think three years is fine. Three years is quite conservative. If you're not cirrhotic three years ago, you're not going to be cirrhotic today. So does that also mean with the APRI blood test, if we've got results on the system? You won't. No one's been doing them. But it's, yeah, it should <laughs> be the same. Have you got an ASTM the AST plate? I see what you, yeah, I see. You've got the historical. Mm -hmm. It should be, yes. It should be. Is that, is that the same for three years? Yeah. yeah. It should be. And I'm just wondering, you know, leave it here. Tomorrow I'll be sussing out all my hip C people and I'll be fired right. up. Right. Which would be great, except that Maverick isn't going to be available until the 1st of December or the 1st of February. And I've treated people with my care, and it was quite complicated yep. for me. And I've spoken to Bridget about, you know, to be 
lurching through the process of owning. And um, I'm just wondering, if I diagnose now, can I say to the people, hey, we found this out, but I'd like you to wait until the 1st of December or the 1st of February to start this amazing new drug that's going to be on the market, or what do you do? Is that ethical? I think, it is. I think it's ethical. For the last three, year, three years, almost, we've been uh, asking people to be treated and telling half of them we have no treatment for them. That's what we've been doing. So with gym type 1 only treatment funded by the government, we've had this terrible inequity. And uh, it's been a real, I think, a hard thing for us to push people to get out there in the community to test patients and then say, well, I'm afraid you know, you've got hep C, uh, but you're going to have to wait for treatment here. You're going to say, you will have treatment, and it's coming you know, in a month or two. Also, we find we, we've put it to the patient, so look, we could start you on this now, but we think before Christmas this other drug will come. Most of them choose to wait. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one word of caution I would have on that is, is I am aware of uh, a couple of patients where it's become a problem in that they've been waiting for this new drug and they've put off their family planning um, needing IVF treatment and so on because of it. And it's all just pushing, pushing, pushing. The fact that Pharmac came out with a consultation document named for medication at the yeah. time, uh, back in August, we're not too far away. Um, what we don't know is what the current discussions are around, and they haven't come out with an indicative time frame other than what we've heard tonight. So, Mark, um, just a couple of things about family planning. Is there's no and this is something which is brought up by Fertility Plus and Fertility Associates over the years. There's no risk to fertility with chronic FC and it won't affect um, uh, IVF treatment. So you can still collect sperm and eggs and, and for, for, for parents who have uh, hepatitis C, your question now is can you be on treatment? They were, yeah, they've, yeah. they've held off on Vicuripac as the treatment because of particular well, of effects. Of um, so it's primarily for that reason. But then you've got everything's delayed, delayed, delayed. So um, it's a conversation that you have to have with the patient. Um, well, you know, from a public perspective, was there a, a health promotion marketing um, nationally of this treatment to the public? There is going to be. Yes. It's yes. not quite yes. as... Um, to uh, help uh, us. Yeah, it's, and the, HP, the health promotions agency right. have been given um, a, a sum of money uh, to roll out the national program. And we're trying to push them to make it national. I mean, I think it should be uh, in people's faces uh, that we have a treatment which cures everyone. You could have hep C, you go and get tested, you'd be cured very, very quickly. Uh, so it is going to be a national approach, uh, and I think the plan is for that to come out after Christmas now. After Christmas. Are you trying to tell me you didn't see this on the back of the three buses we had touring around all the time? But the, the HPA's um, campaign is going to be people like you. So it's again trying to uh, remove the association with uh, hep C and active injected drug use. Because we think that's a way to get to the, the, the broader population. Yes. That will not work in CADS or Net Exchange where you really need some of the other imagery. Yeah. Okay, um, the last thing we'll just touch on here is there's, um, with the laboratory data coming out from Pharmac, there's some reporting requirements due back on that. Um, this will also be on your Mahio system. But, um, I've sort of summarised some of the information that would be valuable for us to understand um, just where that sort of fits. Um, so there's a section in there on, on, the, um, on the reporting as well. Um, I think that's it. So the pathway really is the place to go, uh, the clinical pathway. Um, but this is a quick sort of paint one on this um, process for you to transfer through or understand where you need to go with that particular patient. So where to next? After we've tidied up these patients that we already know about, um, we've still got about 50% that we need to find, and, and Ed and Bridget have talked about these patients um, a, a bit already in there. Um, it is blood to blood. So uh, maybe a conversation with that patient 
on, can they recall when perhaps this happened, or way back 20, 30 years ago? Are you still in contact with those people that maybe you were sharing news with, or however you might have caught it? Um, immediate family and friends, if there's been any potential blood, blood contact, and they talk about things like sharing uh, razor blades or um, razors or toothbrushes even. Um, but just, uh, you know, that's probably the most simple um, direct contact. Patients with alcohol abuse um, tend to abuse other things. Uh, tattoos and piercings, which have been mentioned. Um, a lot of it's prisoners' uh, tattoos within the prisons, um, but even piercings, um, things like that. If one person's got hep C, they potentially pass it on to others. Um, not sure tribal tattoos, Tongan tattoos, when they do that in the backyard, I think that's all very safe and, and uh, we're certainly very aware of those processes. Um, recreational drug use, obviously. Medical tourists. Um, so there's some endemic countries for that, um, Southeast Asia uh, in particular. Um, the blood screening process isn't quite as strong in those areas. Um, uh, they've, we've been working on them and I think they've, they're now up with the play in terms of that. Um, but if they've had gone overseas for uh, procedures historically, um, and maybe ones worth, worth considering um, having a discussion with. I was going to mention something else that I've completely gone out of my mind. Feeling old, feeling tired, run down. I put my hand up for this. I went, great, I can be cured. Give me the drug. If you donate blood, you're automatically tested for this. I donate blood, so I don't have it, so I still feel old and tired, and I don't have a chemical remedy, drug remedy to fix me. Um, but if you've got uh, unexplained, um, you've done all the tests, you've talked about diet exercise, etc. 